the subjects that are on in my slides have been touched on already, so I'm going to focus on the ones that are different. First of all, to give you a little bit of background, so Green Co Capital is an investment firm that specialises in renewable energy and clean tech. Our team is based in, our head office is in London, we also have offices in Dublin and Munich. Our team comes from quite a diverse background, primarily from uh, private equity and banking. We also have some engineers thrown in there as well for a mix. Uh, we have two French speakers and two German speakers in the team, so uh, we're quite comfortable making investments anywhere in Europe. So Green Co Capital is the investment advisor to ESB for their 200 million euro clean tech and private equity fund, the ESB Novus Modus. For those of you not familiar with ESB, they're probably best known here for their Electric Ireland and NIE t and brands. So that ESB Novus Modus Fund has 11 investments to date. So they've been made in uh, solar, also been made in wind, waste, at, or waste, waste heat recovery, and efficient lighting. So that relationship that we have with ESB, we think gives us better access to what's going on from a utility perspective, and also we bring the, the background from uh, private equity and clean tech to that as well. So in addition to managing that fund for ESB, Green Co Capital has also recently launched a UK wind fund, that's to give utilities the ability to recycle cash and rock creating wind assets, like Tom talked about, someone who will finance on a different basis, we're able to take those out from utilities, give them cash back, allow them to build out more assets, but they're also a listed fund, so it gives retail investors access to, that, to assets they wouldn't have heretofore been able to, to get their hands on. So I'm going to start off with a kind of a, essentially quite a big slide. There's an argument that economic development over the last 250 years has been driven by waves of innovation, uh, starting off the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. And while I'm not saying that the IT age of innovation for anybody here from the IT sector is over at the moment, I think you can argue we are on the cusp of a, wave, a new wave of innovation in clean tech. Clean tech is quite a broad church. It's things like uh, sustainability, more efficient ways of transporting goods from A to B. What we're primarily concerned with is, is uh, intelligent energy systems or that, that renewable side of it. The, the key point in this, I mean, you're looking, at, you're looking at a big market. I mean, that's the number one thing. You can quote different figures on you know, the size of the industry all in all. It's undoubtedly a big market today, and we look at some of the drivers to show that I, you know, it's likely to get big, bigger over the next few years. Some of the estimates suggest that between now and 2020 in the UK, about 200, 200 billion euro will have to be spent to upgrade the system and, and meet the 2020 targets, which I'll talk about in a bit. So this, I mean, the, I won't dwell on this slide, it's been touched on before, this is these are the key, the key issues for energy at the moment, you know, at the very top, energy security, you'll see the cold snap in the UK, unexpected cold snap over the last month has put this very, very much back on the uh, news agenda and the public consciousness, and I'll probably see, you know, by the time you get the next winter, it will be part of public policy again, politicians will be talking about security supply. On the left, we have uh, environmental and sustainability. So, you know, all else being equal, uh, price especially, customers have a preference for renewable <coughs> energy. But then there's that piece on the right, it's the affordability. So customers with, an with a, a willingness and an ability to pay more, that's the challenge that's set out. So we said that customers, you know, want renewable energy but aren't necessarily prepared or able to pay for it today, what's driving it? We don't have that pull factor from the market, what are the push factors? Push factors in Europe are the EU 2020 targets, so this is uh, an agreement by all EU countries to reduce energy consumption by 20%, uh, reduce carbon emissions by 20% and have 20% of total electricity demand from renewable sources. Um, as an aside, I think the having EU setting out firm 2020 targets is sort of swinging the momentum of clean tech innovation probably towards Europe at the moment. That's a big driving factor versus, say, the US, where they also have cheap shale gas as well. You know, bringing that specifically back to Northern Ireland, we have the challenge of 40% of uh, energy coming from uh, renewable sources, electricity specifically, as opposed to waste, to heat, or any other subject. Um, that's going to pose its own engineering challenges, particularly as we spoke about already, you know, it's 40% from wind. Um, again, you know, the, this slide has been touched on already, I'm going to, going to zip through it, but 40% wind does change the system, so, you know, just here in, the, here in the slide you can see that previously the evening peak would have been forecastable, it would have been between 5 and 8, now it's moving to whenever the wind is blowing least on any given day, and that poses its in engineering challenges. Here's the point, I guess, where I jump off from the other presenters. It seems like it seems strange to be coming here, particularly walking into the car park today and talking about solar here in Northern Ireland. Um, <laughs> solar, 
and I, I, I guess I caveat this by saying very specifically, I talk about solar in the context of distributed generation technology. Solar isn't going to provide you the scale. Solar isn't going to go a huge way towards meeting your 20, or very little towards meeting your 2020 targets. But if we talk about how the system is going to change and how customers see the system change, distributed generation has been talked about for a long time. And I think finally you have the perfect distributed generation technology in terms of easiness to install, low maintenance as well. The falling CapEx prices have gone a long way towards, for certain customers, and Tom's point, particularly on the payback periods that customers are looking for is interesting. So the levelized cost of energy here is based off 7%. Very few customers probably put 7% into their models. So I guess what I am saying is the falling CapEx prices has changed in the dynamic. So conventional wisdom about solar could never, ever work. I think it's something you should really challenge and, and keep, keep that in the back of your mind. That it's not necessarily always going to be that way. Admittedly, there's consolidation in the solar industry at the moment, so you, you had seen you know, gross margins being almost negative or very, very low. That will change. But there's other areas where the cost, where the total installed cost for solar can come down, like inverters, like installation cost. So that's one to keep an eye on, but it's not, you're not going to see banks of solar arrays and fields in Northern Ireland you're driving around, not predicting that. We are saying it's for certain customer segments, particularly in maybe between the, the larger SME type customers, solar could become interesting as a distributed generation technology. So if we, we talked about how supply is now going to become more and more inflexible, having, you know, how do utilities respond to that from an engineering perspective? Well, having more intelligent metering on the system goes a long way. Having systems that can respond at, at a network level and controllable infrastructure does help, but that only gets you so far. So what you need to move to is a situation where demand is now flexible in response. Things that will do that, electric vehicles are quite interesting. Electric vehicles have the ability to soak up large amounts of power, and they can be somewhat picky about when they do that. Electrification of heating is also interesting. Um, again, it can soak up large amounts of power, particularly where it's clever storage products where you can actually store the heat in, in the heater in an efficient way. Um, ground source and air source heat pumps are ultra, also interesting, maybe less so from the perspective of controllability, but more so for the overall efficiency they provide. Smart meters are very important to this, but I guess what smart meters do is smart meter, as, the, as thermal generation uh, is cycled harder and harder and increases the production costs, you're going to see an increase in price volatility in the market. Smart meters in and of themselves are, aren't particularly interesting, but smart meters do give utilities the ability to pass through those price incentives and those costs that they see. So smart meters are only, in my view, useful as a tool for passing those incentives on to customers. So, who are energy customers? Being, in, being an investor in the clean tech space is a really interesting place to meet. You get to meet a lot of interesting people with it. Really, really, particularly if you come from a technical background, some really incredible solutions to problems. My one gripe is that so many of the solutions that I see at the customer level, at the intelligent energy space, have in the back of their mind that the customer is going to be sitting beside, sitting at home looking at a computer screen of wholesale electricity prices and deciding whether or not to turn on the kettle or that anybody with a washing machine really cares about this. It's, it's not the case. Business customers want to get on with being business customers. So what's going to move demand today from being just, you know, where we see it in the bottom left quadrant where they don't really care, up to customers being more engaged and actually wanting to do something about this. We've talked about smart meters being a tool to pass through that supply volatility, so to give people signals. But it, you need something more than just the signals for our customers to respond. You also need an element of storage is going to be important in that. So particularly where you have storage behind the meter for the customer, if it goes hand in hand with distributed energy solution as well. Intelligent appliances, so that's your washing machine making the decision on behalf of the domestic customer, or clever industrial loads, like we talked about our demand side aggregation units. And hand in hand with that, what you're probably also going to need as well is big data. So if suppliers are going to ask customers to respond in a certain way, Suppliers need to understand how the customers are going to respond when they're asked to do that. Um, big data is going to be an important tool, <coughs> important tool to understand what the, uh, what the elasticities are of customer demand. There are some challenges around that in terms of privacy, but I think it's something that can be, that can be solved and it's in everybody's benefit that we get beyond those issues and, and get the data out there. So I'm not going to dwell, I guess, on, on this slide too long, but I'm to talk just very briefly about the, uh, <coughs> the funding sector. The market for clean tech investments isn't as bullish, say, this year and last year as it would have been in previous years. 
anecdotally, sport would have been the hub of clean tech financing in the US, particularly on the West Coast. You know, we're seeing in, in Dublin, well, not so much in Dublin, but we're certainly seeing in London, West Coast, US, clean tech startups, or we may say maybe a Series B, coming to Europe looking for funding, whereas in the past they would never have had to leave Silicon Valley to do that. So Europe is becoming more of a hub for it, and it's difficult to raise financing. On the positive side, if you are thinking <coughs> and starting up a clean tech company or you're involved in one, Europe is very much the place to be at the moment. <coughs> and clean tech investments are getting funded. So good investments are getting funded. And if you're in Europe, you're in the right place. You're, you're tapping into the right markets in Europe, I think. This is the well talked about, you know, for any technology moving from that point in, in academia where an initial concept has been developed, taking it across the, the valley of death, what to say, for full commercial rollout. Just as a fund, the ESP Novus Modus Fund probably sits at the later stage of the, uh, just on the cusp of mainstream deployment and growth funds of so technology or product that's also been deployed. In terms of Northern Ireland and the opportunities, what really does help companies, genuinely does help companies get across that gap, that valley in the middle, is having a product that's well demonstrated, that's been shown to have customer traction. So demonstrator projects and good customer engagement early on go a long way towards helping, <coughs> towards helping startup companies get across that bridge in the middle. So what are the hot sectors at the moment? We talked about wind. Wind is already pretty mainstream. If people have clever ways of financing wind, that's certainly going to be of interest. Uh, in addition to that, the margins in the projects are so tight that incremental technologies that can be retrofitted, things like making sure that the wind is, that the blades are facing the optimal way to the wind all the time, even marginal incremental improvements like that will certainly be of interest to investors. Solar, the conventional solar prices are falling. Maybe they've hit their end. Maybe there's some innovations there around inverter technology, or even could be just as something almost as simple as having good supply chain techniques and good ways of rolling out solar for uh, distributed generation customers. Energy efficiency is always good. If you think about, think about it from a, an environmental perspective, what's just as good as having more renewable energy while consuming less energy full stop is good. Grid, smart grid and home automation, it's almost like QI, smart grid is such an overused buzzword, I almost expected a big flasher to go off when I said smart grid. Uh, smart grid is of interest, any smart grid solutions probably need to think very much about the customer and have the customer at their heart. And then finally, uh, low carbon heating, so storage, particularly where that's built in with something controllable. To close off, I just thought I'd use the W5 framework to talk about the opportunities for intelligent energy systems in Northern Ireland. You know, why do intelligent energy systems, there's a large global market there, it's only set to get bigger. When, so the incentives are arriving now, we're starting to see them come through in the market. By the time we get to 2020, they'll be very sharp. What are the things of interest? Absolutely new technologies, but also think very much about the business models, how it, how it targets the customer and how it gets to the end user. The who is interesting here in Northern Ireland, if you think about it, it's almost like a ready-made cluster. You have a close concentration of academia, uh, industry and also of customers and startups as well. So you're, you're geographically you're probably prime located. And then where, the where when you think about your solution again, think about not just the system implications, but also the end user and where the energy is going to be consumed ultimately. And that's it for me. Thank you.